I'm going to talk to you guys today about valvular heart disease. Um, and so just first, uh, when we think about valvular heart disease, um, just looking at the prevalence, um, and um, we're more, more concerned when it's moderate to severe in terms of the fact that it could be causing a patient's symptoms and or require um, therapy and or interventions. And so we can see here mitral valve disease probably, I always, think it, I always used to think it was aortic valve disease that we see more often, but it's actually mitral valve disease <clears throat> as we get older. And we can see here that the incidence just rises with the aging population. Um, but in patients over 75, 9% um, of them have some degree of my, uh, significant mitral regurgitation and almost 3% with significant aortic stenosis. And so how do we think about patients who we think may have valvular heart disease? So our initial evaluation usually includes, you know, an HMP, you want to establish um, patient has symptoms, comorbidities, if they have known valve disease, um, and if so, do they have secondary findings such as heart failure? The ECG helps us in establishing if there's any secondary effects in the heart that's affecting the heart rhythm. Um, is there any evidence of hypertrophy? And then echo is probably the cornerstone of an initial evaluation to get information on the um, hemodynamic effects on the heart, as well as establishing which valves are involved and the severity of disease, and then the effects on the pulmonary and the systemic circulation. So how do patients with valvular heart disease present? Um, so a whole host of uh, symptoms. A lot of them actually, you know, you may think the patient has underlying um, coronary artery disease because they can present with angina. Um, they can present with heart failure symptoms or arrhythmia. Um, probably the most common um, trigger that we think, oh, a patient may have underlying valvular heart disease um, are, is, are the last three there. So cardiac murmur on exam is probably the most common one and then otherwise abnormal findings on an, on an otherwise normal exam. And then probably, I don't know if this is the more common, just incidentally seen on a non-invasive test that was done for another reason. So just to talk a little bit about cardiac murmurs. So murmurs are caused by flow turbulence um, through the heart chambers. The intensity of the murmur, a lot of times we think it's related to how severe the disease is, but not necessarily, but to depend upon how big the orifice is. <clears throat> So in stenotic cases, the smaller the orifice, the um, can be louder intensity. Um, pressure difference across the narrowing will affect the intensity, as well as um, just how much blood flow overall is going through the through the chambers. So if you have a lot of if you have like a lot of blood flow, like either um, either a hyperdynamic state or otherwise, then you might just hear a louder murmur. But that's just because of loud of a lot of blood flow, not necessarily severity of disease. Um, in addition, just where the um, lesion is located relative to where your stethoscope is, and then just how it's flowing and if it um, can all affect the intensity of the murmur. So just a reminder, so shallow bell for low frequencies and use the diaphragm for the higher frequencies. It's important to time the murmur relative to when you hear S1 and S2. That helps us in distinguishing is this a systolic murmur or a diastolic murmur, and then that gives us clues as to what valves may be involved. Um, can also time it to the carotid pulse if it's hard to tell which one's S1 and S2. So just use the pulsations there. Um, so just the main four locations where we might hear murmurs from specific valves. The loudest generally is mitral murmurs we think about in the apical, seg apical areas. Aortic murmurs tend to be in the right upper sternal border, pulmonic left upper, and the tricuspid tends to be along the left um, lateral uh, sternal border. Just a word about intensity. We usually grade them <clears throat> for systolic murmurs on a scale to six. Grade one just being very faint. Um, and grade two, sorry, grade one and grade two just usually faint, kind of like the same intensity as you might hear the S1 and S2. And then louder as we get into the higher grades. Um, grade six, loudest can be heard without a stethoscope. In general, diastolic murmurs, we usually only hear about four grades because usually they don't get loud enough to hear grade five and six. So they're usually graded out, you usually see diastolic murmurs out of um, up to grade four. The other characteristics that can be 
sometimes helpful is the pitch, meaning is it high pitched or low pitch, and then just the quality of the sound. Certain types of valve lesions tend, are, tend to be associated with certain types of um, quality of the way the murmur may sound. And some of this is just experience, having heard a lot of different murmurs, you just get used to, oh, that's a mitral murmur, or, or oh, that's an aortic stenosis murmur, just because you just, or you get used to hearing like that's what that type of um, lesion usually sounds like. Um, and so that kind of plays an effect into what the kind of uh, shape of the murmur is. It, is it like a crescendo murmur? Is it a decrescendo murmur? Is it a crescendo then decrescendo? Or is it just kind of plateau, same across? Um, the whole uh, when you're hearing it. <clears throat> and so for systolic murmurs, more common ones we hear are like whole systolic murmurs, meaning it goes throughout all of systole. Um, mid systolic, where you don't hear it until the middle of systole. Um, early systolic or mid to late systolic. And again, those can all be associated with specific types of valvular lesions. Diastolic murmurs, more commonly, they, they, they'll be, they, you might hear them early or mid diastolic or even pre systolic. Um, and then continuous murmurs you'll hear throughout both um, the um, systolic and diastolic um, portions of the cardiac cycle. Another feature in helping to distinguish um, what's going on is using something we call dynamic auscultation. So using features like having a patient take a deep breath in or expiration to kind of determine whether this is something coming from the right or the left side of the heart. In general, with inspiration, right-sided murmurs will increase in intensity and then left-sided ones will um, increase more with expiration. A valsalva maneuver can help distinguish between somebody who may have outflow tract obstruction from something like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy versus um, um, other versus something like aortic stenosis. <clears throat> General murmurs from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or mitral valve prolapse will become louder with valsalva, whereas all other types of murmurs tend to decrease. Generally, when a patient's exercising, they're getting increased blood flow throughout the heart chamber, so exercise will generally increase all murmurs. And then positional changes, again, can help in distinguishing if you're trying to tell if this is like aortic stenosis or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, having someone stand quickly um, will increase a murmur that's related to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but may decrease aortic stenosis murmurs. Um, other kinds of techniques we can use um, in patients who have AFib, and if the um, cycle lengths are irregular, you might take a listen after an early beat or a long beat or a long cycle. Systolic murmurs um, that are related to stenotic lesions generally increase, but regurgitant lesions tend to decrease after a long cycle length. And then drug interventions, we haven't really, we don't really do this anymore, but certain drugs we can give to try and increase the intensity of murmurs or help distinguish between different types of murmurs. Other associated findings, as I mentioned, like where the where you hear the murmur the loudest can help distinguish what type of valve is involved, how it's affecting S1 and S2. Um, is S2 soft? Um, is it absent? Um, looking at the jugular venous waveform, so all of these are kind of physical findings that can help us distinguish uh, what kind of valvular lesion we're talking about. <clears throat> and this is just a chart to show kind of based on whether the murmur is a systolic or a diastolic murmur and where it's located on the chest wall can help us determine is this a mitral lesion, is it mitral regurgitation or mitral stenosis? Um, and then you can see their continuous murmurs and what they can be um, attributed to. Using, um, in addition to murmurs and, or, and portions of the physical exam, uh, associating them with, with the patient's um, History can be very helpful for determining what kind of um, lesion this is, you know, is it, and then helps us in determining whether or not the patient needs further intervention or, or management. So how old the patient is, are they having symptoms or not, or, or not related to um, the valvular disease? Um, and then, as I said, a whole host of different symptoms that can be sometimes difficult to distinguish between whether this is related to the valvular heart disease or some other cardiac or even pulmonary disease that could be um, concomitantly associated with the patient's um, valvular disease. The um, second thing I had on the list was the ECG. 
Um, even though it's considered more of a screening test, but if the ECG is completely normal, that gives you a clue that maybe the, even the patient, if the patient has valvular heart disease, it's probably not causing any untoward secondary effects on the heart. Um, things we might see that could indicate um, um, more significant disease, if there's evidence of hypertrophy, chamber enlargement, conduction abnormalities or arrhythmias, um, and or evidence of infarction or ischemia on the ECG. And then as I mentioned, echocardiography is probably the first choice of test when we know a patient has valvular disease. It helps us with defining, you know, which valve is involved, um, how severe the lesion is. It can um, help us with defining the hemodynamics within the heart. So how is it uh, secondarily affecting the heart structures? Are there other abnormalities associated with the underlying primary disease? <clears throat> it helps to establish a reference point in somebody who um, maybe has newly diagnosed disease that, you're, that may um, progress in the future. So we um, can see where we stand now and it gives us a, um, information as to what, when we might consider adjusting medications or therapies or timing of further interventions. When do we do additional testing? Um, so if a patient has equivocal symptoms and you're trying to determine, well, could this be from valvular heart disease or not? Um, if there's a discrepancy between what your exam is like, so you hear this really loud murmur on exam and it doesn't sound like it's just a flow, innocent flow murmur, but the echoes doesn't show very much, then you might consider doing additional testing. Um, other tests, maybe the echo is limited. Um, it can only show you a little bit of the valve. And so if you want to further delineate what's going on, additional testing may be needed. Um, and finally, to, in some patients, um, again, if you're trying to decide on whether a patient needs uh, further therapies or intervention, it's often helpful to uh, correlate whether a patient's symptoms definitely correlates to the valvular disease. And if it's, is, it, is this then causing secondary effects on the pulmonary circulation that could be a, causing the patient's underlying symptoms. And so something like a stress test may help with that. So these other additional tests, um, chest X-ray, this is particularly important in a patient who's symptomatic. It can give you some clues as to the heart size, whether there's vascular pulmonary vascular congestion or intrinsic lung disease, um, as well as looking for calcification in the aorta and the pericardium. Um, TEE, this provides high quality assessments of particularly the valves that are in the back of the heart. So we think of the mitral valve <clears throat> um, and, uh, and maybe pulmonic valve, but it, um, particularly prosthetic valves can just give you a clearer view as to what's going on, particularly for um, regurgitant lesions or paravalvular lesions, um, which can be seen here on this image up on the top or other associated abnormalities, if there's masses or there's thrombus within the heart, the TEE can help in this sense. Cardiac MRI um, can be useful for providing information about the secondary effects and chamber um, size and function. Um, it's considered the gold standard for LV um, and RV size and function. It can be a secondary test to assess valve severity. So let's say there's a discrepancy between what you're seeing by physical exam and then what the echo is telling you. Um, MRI can give you another assessment of, uh, particularly like for the aortic valve, um, how significant the stenosis or the regurgitation is. It can also give you information on concomitant like aortic disease. This is a patient, I don't know if you can tell here, that actually has a bicuspid valve, but it has a dilated aorta that kind of goes along with a bicuspid valve. Other testing that can be considered and may be helpful in certain scenarios. So PET CT, if there's, if there's a question, if there's active inflammation or infection. Stress testing can give you an objective measure of a patient's exercise capacity. And then catheterization to measure the intracardiac and pulmonary pressures. Uh, it's another secondary assessment of valve severity. Again, if there's a discrepancy in what your tests are showing you compared to how the patient's presenting. And then finally, hemodynamic, give you information on the hemodynamic response to different, um, to exercise or to drugs. 
Okay, and then finally, other tests that can be helpful for risk stratification in a specific patient. So looking at biomarkers, um, using TTE strain, CMR looking at fibrosis um, by late gallon enhancement. Stress testing also provides some prognostic markers, such as you know what the what how, an exercise capacity of the patient um, and their um, response to exercise. We use risk scores to quantify the patient's risk for undergoing um, um, further interventions if needed, and then a frailty score, um, risk of a procedure and the chance of recover recovery of quality of life. With pre-procedural testing, if you're going to, if a patient's going to be referred for valve intervention, you, you, this is just some additional testing that should be um, considered. So dental exams, you want to rule out a potential infection source, so that's important. CT angiogram or a left heart cath to um, evaluate the coronary anatomy <clears throat> that might have an effect in terms of determining what type of intervention in a specific patient. Uh, peripheral CT to look for if a patient's being considered for a TAVR, TAVI, um, or other transcatheter procedures to look at the um, access points. And then cardiac CT, the suitability for some of these um, transcatheter procedures. Um, all right, I think my next, let me see if I can get the poll up. Okay, can you guys see this? I don't know if you um, kind of set this up as a poll. Which of the following surgeries has the lowest operative mortality? And you guys can vote. Um, just run for a little bit and you guys can kind of decide what you think. So <clears throat> I see about 50% of you have finished voting. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Share results. Okay. Can you guys see that? I don't know. Okay. So most of you guys mentioned that, um, chose a um, aortic valve replacement. Again, this is the one with the lowest operative replacement. And this is surgery that we're talking about here. So aortic valve replacement, and then a um, quarter of you guys with a mitral valve replacement. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. So, at, oh, okay. It's actually mitral valve repair. If we look here, um, mitral valve repair actually has the lowest mortality rate. Um, AVR then is the second lowest, 2.2%. Uh, and then the highest are the com combination procedures, so double valve procedures or mitral valve plus cabbage. So when we think about valvular heart disease, um, it's similar with heart failure, which I don't know if, you've, if you guys have had your heart failure talk. Um, the new classification guidelines, we divide them into stages. Um, so stage A are patients who don't have any valvular disease, but they're at risk for developing valvular heart disease. So we can think about somebody who, you know, who maybe has an infection, bacteremia, or like, you know, um, Staff. That's somebody who doesn't have valvular heart disease, but they're at risk for developing valvular heart disease because of their underlying, um, underlying condition. Um, stage B is progressive, so patients who actually have valvular lesions, but they're in the mild to moderate severity and shouldn't be causing any symptoms related to the valvular disease. Stage C, the um, patient with the severe valvular disease, but they're asymptomatic. Um, they subdivide this into C1, where the LV and RV are compensated, and C2, where LV and RV are decompensated. And then again, subdivide into those that are asymptomatic at C, and then once you're symptomatic, you fall into stage D. All right, um, endocarditis prophylaxis, just since we were talking about endocarditis, just a reminder here. So antibiotics may be required for patients who are having dental work because that's the one that's the highest risk for developing endocarditis. 
Patients who are undergoing respiratory tract procedures, such as a biopsy or an incision, um, skin procedures, especially if there's infected skin um, or infection in the musculoskeletal tissue, and then patients who are undergoing cardiac surgery with prosthetic material. And I do have another poll question here. All right. So which of the following conditions should have endocarditis prophylaxis prior to dental work? And you guys can vote. Um, someone with a history, and you can, you can choose more than one. So someone with a history of infective endocarditis, um, somebody with a history of mitral valve repair, someone who's had aortic valve replacement, rheumatic mitral disease, bicuspid aortic disease, or history of heart transplant with aortic stenosis. And this is multiple choice. I mean, this one, there can be more than one answer. I'll let this run for another 10 seconds or so. Okay, I'm gonna end the polling and share the results. All right, so this is what you guys thought. So patients who've had infective endocarditis, um, patients who've um, had an AVR, rheumatic mitral valve disease, and history of heart transplant with aortic stenosis. Um, All right, so it's actually, um, Patient, so the first three plus the last one. Um, patients who actually have had rheumatic mitral valve disease and bicuspid aortic valve disease, at least by the current guidelines, they do not qualify um, for endocarditis prophylaxis, but everybody, um, but all the other three do. And this is just um, from the guidelines, class 2A um, indication. Um, and I think the, um, prosthetic material used in valve repair, that was added as of the most recent update. Um, so patients who have an annual plasty ring, some kind of prosthetic material in there, they're actually also considered for um, endocarditis prophylaxis. Um, interestingly, those with rheumatic heart mitral valve disease or bicuspid aortic valve are not considered, um, at least by the current guidelines, that they need to have endocarditis prophylaxis. And then, <clears throat> just other cases that used to, we used to use endocarditis prophylaxis, but we don't anymore. Non-dental procedures in the absence of infection, so TEEs, EGDs, colonoscopy, cystoscopy, those no longer require endocarditis prophylaxis. <clears throat> um, just because we're running short on time, we're going to skip this, but you guys can look up what the antibiotic regimens are. Um, we talked about endocarditis prophylaxis. What about rheumatic fever prophylaxis? So this is one of the most important causes of valvular heart disease, um, particularly in undeveloped, underdeveloped countries. And um, antibiotic regimens usually penicillin-based type, um, unless they're allergic to penicillins, then um, macrolides or sulfa, sulfadiazine can be used. And primary prevention for rheumatic fever, you know, just treating the acute strep infection. Secondary prevention, prevention, you can see in patients who've had evidence of carditis with rheumatic fever. It's a long um, um, time for, um, <clears throat> for um, antibiotic intervention, uh, usually depending upon when they develop or how old they are, and then until they um, are at least 40 years of age. All right, moving on to some cases. So case one. RB is a 43-year-old um, man who has returned from Guatemala. He's presenting with feverish chills and shortness of breath. He has a history of psoriasis on immunosuppression, hypertension, and mitral valve prolapse that was diagnosed 10 years ago. On exam, he's thin and athletic. His heart rate's 100. He's tachycardic. Blood pressure is stable. He's statting 100% on room air. He's not tachypnic. <clears throat> JVP is a little generous but he has normal carotid obstructs. His breast sounds are diminished, but there's no, uh, sorry, his breast sounds are diminished with no crackles, and we can't feel an apical impulse, and hopefully you guys can see that. Can you guys hear that? <clears throat> 
my nephews, right? Is what murmur are we hearing here? And the polling in like five seconds. All right. So um, those of you who voted, um, mitral vegetation versus aortic stenosis. Um, so great that you, you identified that it's a systolic murmur. <clears throat> And this one um, is actually a mitral regurgitation murmur. Um, sure. So I, hopefully you could tell it was holosystolic, kind of like we described as sort of like a blowing murmur. The other clue that might have, or the other thing that may have clued you in is the patient has a history of mitral valve prolapse. <clears throat> Next one. Um, neither S1 or S2 are well heard because of this, again, blowing murmur located the apex and left parasternal border. Um, the echo, let me just show you. Okay. The echo shown here just shows that their mitral valve is thickened and um, somewhat redundant, but it looks like there could be something on the mitral valve leaflet itself. And there's significant mitral regurgitation um, that can be seen here on the um, color Doppler. So this is a patient with um, mitral regurgitation. Oops. And we say it's probably acute because of the way its presentation is. When we think of acute mitral regurgitation, things we think about are endocarditis, acute MI, um, ruptured cordae, usually if you have a myxomatous valve. Again, he was somebody who had a history of mitral valve prolapse. Or if you have prosthetic valves, you get sudden dysfunction of the prosthetic valve. Um, with acute mitral regurgitation, the heart suddenly has this um, acute abrupt volume overload and really because there's no time for adapt adaptation. So with, there's a sudden decrease in the forged stroke volume and then a sudden backflow or sudden increase in the LA volumes and pressures, which can increase the increased pulmonary ve venous pressures. So depending upon the timing and depending upon the um, hemodynamic changes, the murmur that you might hear may not actually may be actually short and unimpressive, but this can be very rapidly fatal when it's again acute mitral regurgitation. In this acute setting, really, you have to take the patient to the OR unless they don't have any any um, unless they have contraindications or quality of life or whatnot. But um, prompt mitral valve surgery is is the life saving procedure here. Medical stabilization stabilization prior to with um, vasodilators nitroprusside nicardipine, but if a patient's hypotensive, then it's very limiting, and really it's an intraaortic balloon pump. Now, chronic mitral regurgitation is a different story. This usually is just from um, degeneration, often from exomatous valve disease. It can be from coronary disease with the development of ischemic mitral regurgitation, or in patients who have rheumatic heart disease, um, or if you have subacute, slow kind of infective endocarditis can also lead to chronic mitral regurgitation. And unlike the acute scenario, now because everything is gradual, um, the heart can accommodate for this and adapt. And so the left atrium can become, um, in, be, can increase in its compliance and slowly becomes dilated. The LV also because of the increased forward volume with um, the regurgitation lesion can also become dilated. And actually you see what 
seems to be an increase in your ejection fraction in order to maintain forward uh, stroke volume. And the compensation can last for years, but eventually you'll um, develop volume overload and LV decompensation. So as I mentioned, this comp compensatory phase can last like 10 to 15 years. Um, patients who have severe mitral regurgitation who are asymptomatic, the mortality rate is estimated about 5% per year. But once an ejection fraction drops below 60%, or if a patient becomes symptomatic, then the mortality rises sharply and um, patients um, develop progressive dyspnea and heart failure. This slide is just showing the stages of primary mitral regurgitation. So we talked about the different stages. So stage A, patient at risk for mitral regurgitation. B, they've developed regurgitation. Um, <clears throat> but um, are asymptomatic, and then C, they have severe mitral regurgitation, um, and so you can see here the valve hemodynamics and the hemodynamic consequences. We talked a little bit already about kind of the initial evaluation of patients with valvular disease in general. Um, this holds true with mitral regurgitation. You might want to consider doing an exercise test in a patient just to see what um, their functional capacity is because a patient may um, change their physical um, activities just because uh, as part of um, the disease process. On exam, we sort of went over a little bit of this. It's usually a holosystolic murmur, often at the apex. If they have heart failure, you might hear an S3 on exam as well. In chronic mitral regurgitation, the intensity murmur does correlate with the severity. As I mentioned, in acute mitral regurgitation, you may have a short, depending on the hemodynamics, you may have just a short or um, the murmur may not really be that obvious. In patients with chronic mitral regurgitation, depending upon the stage, um, follow up um, for the asymptomatic, um, mild, or moderate uh, phases would be office intervals tw every 12 months and echo intervals uh, one to five years, depending upon the degree. Once they're in the severe stage, follow-ups recommended every six to 12 months. And um, particularly once the LV is dilated, they recommend less, um, less than six month follow-up, both um, clinical follow-up as well as echocardiogram. For medical therapy in a patient with mitral regurgitation, Generally, there's no accepted treatment if there's in an asymptomatic patient. Unfortunately, none of the therapies there has been shown to actually um, provide any mortality um, uh, or morbidity benefit. Although they, is, if the patient's hypertensive, it is important to control the hypertension and maybe an ACE inhibitor might be more helpful than some of the other medications. If a patient has atrial fibrillation, rate control, anticoagulation, um, and then patients with functional or ischemic mitral regurgitation, um, treatment of the underlying LV dysfunction is, is important. Um, oops, I think our slides are skipping. Okay. And then for intervention, when do you intervene on the valve? So if they're symptomatic, regardless of what their LV function is, they should have um, an intervention. If they're not symptomatic and they have severe LV dysfunction and L as well, sorry, severe mitral regurgitation, and they have evidence of severe of LV dysfunction, so an EF that's less um, that's less than 50%, then they should be considered for intervention. And in general, as I've shown you by the mortality data, mitral valve repair is preferable to replacement just because it has lowest operative mortality risk. And then this is just kind of a chart to kind of, you know, take you down when you would consider different, um, um, uh, consider mitral valve surgery and or um, uh, kind of like the watchful waiting. And again, a lot of this depends upon the, uh, severity of the mitral regurgitation, whether a patient's symptomatic or not, and the hemodynamic effects on the LV. Okay, moving on. MV is a 45-year-old woman who has fatigue and declining exercise tolerance. Her past medical history is significant for hypertension, tobacco use, diabetes, dyslipidemia, and obesity. On exam, she's thin, pleasant. She has um, a heart rate in the 90s, but it's irregularly irregular, a little bit elevated blood pressure. JVP is normal, but she does have some crackles on exam. And this is what her murmur sounds like. 
and not sure there's a lot of extra heart sounds in there, but um, the um, this kind of just gives you a, what hopefully you could hear on the um, on the audio, but um, patient has um, an extra sound that's an, in addition to the S1 and S2, an opening snap sound, and then there's just this little diastolic um, um, sound that's heard that's shortly following S2. Her echo shows a thickened and immobile mitral valve, no calcification, some fusion of the subvalvular apparatus. Her left atrium is dilated. Her um, Doppler shows evidence of stenosis with a gradient of three and an area of 1.8. And so the question is, which of the following medical therapies should be started? You guys can choose there. Aspirin, warfarin, epixaban, metoprolol, isoproteranol. Five seconds, I'm gonna end the polling. Okay, um, this is what you guys thought. So nobody said aspirin, I just spelled wrong, but um, warfarin, um, apixaban, metoprolol, and then isoproteranol. Um, so most of you guys chose apixaban. And actually, The answer is actually warfarin, and we'll go over why that's the case. So with this patient has mitral stenosis, um, normal mitral valve area is four to five centimeters squared. Um, but patients usually don't develop symptoms until the area is less than two and a half centimeters squared. We divide this into progressive, moderate. Um, oh, actually, this is an old slide. Um, this is not, this is, we, we divide into progressive and severe, actually. So severe now is anything that is less than 1.5. Um, the most common cause is rheumatic heart disease. 40% um, of all patients with rheumatic heart disease develop um, some type of carditis, and um, about 60% of patients can develop pure mitral stenosis. Other causes of mitral stenosis, congenital malformations, but usually know this from when they were um, as a child. And then acquired cases are rare, but you may have the pseudomitral stenosis from like a myxoma, a bowel, ball and valve thrombus, um, severe mitral annual calcification, which we've seen here with our um, kidney, kidney transplant population, and then endocarditis. Interestingly, twice as many women as men present with isolated mitral stenosis. Um, so oftentimes what you see is the thickening of the mitral leaflets, um, fusion at the commissures on the side, so it just doesn't open very well. We get this um, <clears throat> doming of the uh, leaflets and the very characteristic findings is that the tips of the leaflets and usually the subvalvular apparatus, so the chordae and everything become fibrotic and thickened. And as a result, there's like tunting of the um, tips when the valve opens that leads to the uh, stenosis that's seen. Um, with mitral stenosis, you get slow increase in the left atrial pressure, which can lead to increased pulmonary venous pressure with interstitial edema. The um, body adapts by, with pulmonary vascular constriction into small hyperplasia, medial hyperplasia, and they can develop pulmonary hypertension as a result. The subclinical phase of rheumatic uh, heart disease can be 20 to 40 years. And um, patients can have symptoms for 10 years before the symptoms actually become disabling. Um, here you can see the survival rate um, once they start developing symptoms. So 10 years survival to zero to 15% um, with systemic um, 
and then 10 to 20 percent develop systemic embolization 30 to 40 percent atrial fibrillation and once they develop severe pulmonary hypertension the uh, survival rate is less than three years i'm not going to go over this but this kind of just shows you sort of what you what would be expected at the different stages of uh, mitral stenosis and what the hemodynamics reflect again similar is with other valvular disease initial evaluation history physical ecg echocardiogram and consideration of other testing on physical exam there are some interesting findings that are unique to mitral stenosis you might see a prominent a wave in the jugular venous pulsations uh, this is due to pulmonary development of pulmonary hypertension and right ventricular hypertrophy um, these patients often will have signs of right-sided heart failure um, once the disease is advanced. And then there's a characteristic kind of mitral facies where the, um, they get pink purple patches on their cheeks as a result of uh, vasoconstriction. The murmur of mitral stenosis, so this is a diastolic murmur, it's often low pitched, so better heard with the bell. It's most prominent at the apex, and oftentimes, if a patient's just lying flat, you may not hear it. You actually need to roll the patient over onto the left side, and that's just because the mitral valve is in the posterior part of the body, so you want to bring it closer up to the front of the body where you're listening. Um, the intensity of the murmur doesn't correlate with the severity of stenosis, so this is one of those um, that you can't, just because the murmur is loud, doesn't necessarily mean that they have sen severe mitral stenosis. Uh, the snap, that opening snap that you can sometimes hear, um, that's usually heard only when the leaflets are still mobile. Once they've gotten into more severe stages, and if you no longer hear the opening snap, it's probably more severe. And um, the shorter the, the, the um, timing between the um, S2 to the opening snap indicates more severe disease. EKG can show atrial fibrillation and left atrial enlargement. The chest X-ray may show um, pulmonary congestion. Sometimes you can see that the valve is calcified, but echo is really the gold standard for diagnosing um, mitral stenosis, and uh, particularly if it's rheumatic related mitral stenosis, we're looking for characteristic findings. Follow-up, yearly follow-ups recommended. Again, this is um, the asymptomatic phase can last a long time. Um, echo intervals, as we can see here, um, three to five years for progressive, progressive, one to two years once they're in the severe phase. In terms of medical therapy, again, prevention is the biggest one. So if they have, um, if they if they develop strep, uh, acute pharyngitis, treatment of the acute pharyngitis. If they have evidence of carditis, then rheumatic fever prophylaxis to prevent progression of the carditis. Um, it's interesting because um, the mitral so the valvular guideline, valvular disease guidelines do recommend endocarditis prophylaxis, but the endocarditis the endocarditis guidelines do not specifically recommend it in mitral in rheumatic mitral stenosis. Um, it's important to control the heart rate because. Since the mitral valve is stenotic, it relies a lot on filling time. And so the shorter the filling time, then the more symptomatic a patient may be. So you want this slow heart rate in order to decrease um, development of symptoms. And if a patient develops atrial fibrillation, they often can become very symptomatic because they often will need that atrial kick just to get the blood flow across the mitral valve. Um, so prompt management in patients who develop atrial fibrillation um, again, an atrial fibrillation usually is associated with tachycardia too, which is another thing that can lead to decompensation. Anticoagulation, if they have AFib, a prior embolic event, or known left atrial thrombus. In terms of intervening on these patients, uh, percutaneous mitral valve, um, balloon valvotomy um, in patients who have favorable anatomy, um, that's probably one of the more preferred um, methods of repair, of uh, fixing the mitral valve. So mitral valve repair, open commissurotomy, or mitral valve replacement. <clears throat> and we saw from the earlier slides, the mitral valve replacement has the highest mortality rate. Um, just gonna quickly kind of, you guys will have this, so, oh, sorry. So this, just to kind of address the question. So with patients with valvular heart disease and AFib, if they have rheumatic mitral stenosis, long-term vitamin K antagonist anticoagulation is indicated. Um, if they have um, patients who have native valve disease, except uh, but not rheumatic, then a NOAC or a vitamin K base on the CHAD score is used. And this is again uh, valve heart disease and AFib. And then if they have a bioprosthetic valve, um, nuanced at AFib, and it's within three months of valve 
valve implantation than anticoagulation with uh, vitamin K antagonists. So some of the disqualifiers with the um, DOAX um, are that it's in the AFib, but in the absence of valvular heart disease, and they're thinking more rheumatic heart disease, and that's where um, the guidelines kind of come in and say, no, in these patients, it really should be um, warfarin as opposed to one of the newer, newer agents. Um, they've kind of opened it up for other valve, other types of valve disease, non-rheumatic, um, but if you technically read the label of the DOAX, it's in the absence of valvular heart disease. <clears throat> All right, case three, an 82-year-old retired teacher presenting the ED with palpitations and dyspnea associated with lower extremity swelling. She just has a history of hypertension and um, osteoarthritis. She's on uh, medications for her hypertension. On exam, she's thin elderly, um, heart rate's tachycardic and irregular, blood pressure is a little bit high, JVP is a little bit elevated. She has crackles on exam, and this is her murmur. So this is another systolic murmur, unlike the prior one, um, where it was kind of whole systolic, the same intensity all throughout in this particular case. I'll just play it again. Hopefully you can hear that it kind of has um, a crescendo, decrescendo character, and there's obscuration of the S2. And so this is a patient that um, likely has um, aortic stenosis. <clears throat> EKG shows AFib, evidence of left atrial dilatation. She has mild conduction disease. The echo shows um, calcified aortic valve with a valve area of 0.6. Her LV is normal in size, and she does have evidence of left ventricular hypertrophy on the echo. So how would you manage this patient? Refer her for an EP study and possible ablation. Begin a torvastatin in 80. Refer for consideration of valvuloplasty. <clears throat> refer for coronary arteriography, anticipation of an aortic valve replacement. Cardiovert the patient and manage her medically with beta blockers and anticoagulation. I'll leave it up for maybe 10 more seconds because we're running short on time. Okay. And great. So um, let's see if you put refer for coronary arteriography, anticipation of AVR, and that's the correct answer. All right, so this is a symptomatic patient with aortic stenosis. Aortic stenosis um, cause um, can be congenital, rheumatic, or degenerative, depending upon the age of the patients. Um, patients that are less than 70 usually have a congenital cause for their stenosis. Patients over 70, usually it's degenerative. Um, this is just some diagram showing what a normal aortic valve looks like and a bicuspid aortic valve, and then what it happens when they get stenotic. Just some gross pathology showing you what where you know what the lesions actually kind of look like in the in the heart. Echocardiography, as I mentioned, is usually our um, initial imaging test to kind of diagnose the valve lesion as well as determine severity. This is a patient with a, you can see three leaflets and then sort of mimics what you saw in the gross pathology there. And but now you can see functionally that it's just not opening very well. The normal aortic valve area is about three to four. And when the um, circulation um, becomes diminished or we don't, patients tend to not feel symptomatic until the area goes below one. 
um, just distinguishing aortic stenosis and aortic sclerosis. So aortic sclerosis refers to just focal areas that you may see valve calcification and thickening, but there's no significant obstruction. And we should define that as a peak velocity across the valve of um, more than um, 2.5, sorry, less than 2.5 to indicate there's some sort of hemodynamic significance to the stenosis. Um, mild, moderate to severe here, kind of corresponding either to the valve area or the gradient across the valve. And the primary adaptation in a patient who has stenosis is, to, is for the ventral hole to bulk up. Um, so concentric hypertrophy, similar to mitral stenosis, the latent phase can last decades as your, as your heart adapts to the aortic stenosis. And actually the risk of sudden death in this phase is very low, but once the patient starts um, developing significant degrees of aortic stenosis, they can develop, um, they can progress pretty quickly. But it's important to note that actually 50% of patients who have severe aortic stenosis don't necessarily progress. So we really rely on the patient and their history and how it's affecting their activities of daily living in determining whether or not a patient should undergo um, treatment for aortic stenosis. Let's keep going. Um, the main symptoms that we get concerned about that a patient really needs to um, have intervention, um, if they start developing symptoms of angina, think of your heart failure, because you can see here that they just basically fall off the curve and do much better if they have valve replacement um, compared to if they don't have valve replacement. I'm gonna skip the stages here, but um, just with regards to, um, Low gradient AS, this is a term that we, we often will hear about. So this is a special case where um, in a patient who has low cardiac output, the valve may not necessarily be significantly stenotic, but it's more that you just don't have enough oomph in your heart to open it. So it's measuring as being um, small, the valve area. Um, so we often will we'll recommend doing a functional testing with dibutamine to assess whether uh, this is just a, a, a problem with low cardiac output, or is this actually true, true, the patient has stenotic valve. Follow-up, yearly follow-up in the mild stages, um, interval follow-up um, six months clinically and um, six months to two years, depending upon the stage of their um, aortic stenosis. And then medical therapy, antibiotic prophylaxis, if they have rheumatic fever, uh, to cautiously treat the hypertension if they have that. And then right now they recommend statin therapy for patients who have calcific aortic stenosis based on what their standard risk scores are. So again, use your risk guidelines um, for determination of whether a patient would benefit from statin therapy. And just a comment, I think we're yeah, running short of time. So, we, we've been, um, there's often this debate on whether or not a patient would benefit from um, surgical aortic valve replacement versus um, transcatheter approaches. Transcatheter approaches have been um, in vogue now over the past decade, and so now they've become an alternative to surgical. And it's just a little diagram to show kind of what's involved. So with a transcatheter, we put a catheter in across the aortic valve, and then a stented valve, so when you blow up the um, balloon, it, it places the stented valve there. So, so with regards to um, replacing the valve, so in, in the cases of um, choice of valves, mechanical versus bioprosthetics, in general, um, this should be a decision between the patient, um, underlying their values and preferences, and discussion about, you know, anticoagulation therapy and the need for potential versus the potential need for inter reintervening on the valve at a future date. Um, if patient cannot tolerate anticoagulation, then obviously a bioprosthetic valve is recommended. But general guidelines are if patients are less than 50 and they have no contraindications to anticoagulation, it's reasonable to choose a mechanical prosthesis over the bioprosthetic valve. If they're between 50 and 65, we can individualize the choice, but and then in patients who are over 65, it's reasonable to choose a bioprosthetic valve. So what about surgery versus um, TAVR or TAVI? So surgery, if the patient's less than 65 years with more than 25 year, 20 year of life expectancy, patients between 65 and 80, um, either 
can be you know, a balance between patient longevity and valve durability. And then TAVR, if they're uh, greater than 80 years of life with a life expectancy um, less than 10 years um, or no anat anatomic con contraindication. Um, in general, surgical replacement recommended for patients asymptomatic but has um, other signs suggestive of um, significant aortic stenosis. Surgery also, um, if they have factors that make them unsuitable for TAVR, and so we mentioned earlier on about doing CT scans to look for these other factors that may make TAVR um, more complicated or not feasible. And then otherwise, TAVR is recommended in patients who have a higher prohibitive surgical risk, um, but only if their predicted survival is at least a year. Unfortunately, there are no medical therapies that can prevent or delay the disease process. And so if a patient cannot, if a patient uh, meets criteria for replacement, but cannot, but is considered to um, not be a good surgical or um, transcatheter risk, then palliative medical management um, can, should be discussed. And then just final word about balloon valvuloplasty. This can provide immediate hemodynamic improvement, but it's not a long-term durable solution because there's recurrence rates uh, where they just get stenotic again, often pretty quickly, but within six months, and can be associated with increasing complications compared to um, doing a TAVR or surgical replacement. But we use it as a bridge um, also, also to, in patients who have significant stenosis to see if there's any clinical improvement and if they would benefit from TAVR.